Good morning. Welcome. Please stand and turn in your hymnals to page 13 as we worship the Lord together. Crown him with many crowns. Page 13.
you know that we're going to do something a little unusual today. We're going to keep the live stream up through the baptisms. We've got baptisms scheduled today after the service as well as tonight. And we've got some online that want to want to, want to join in. All right. So that'll be, that'll be a blessing. And I appreciate those who are uh, faithful to join us online and you and, and 
live or out of town are able to tune in to see what's going on back home. So grateful, grateful for that. Let me uh, remind our school family that there's no school tomorrow. BBS, no school tomorrow to celebrate President's Day. <laughs> and this week is basketball tournament week for both our varsity girls and varsity guys. Uh, the guys are at the annual uh, classic tournament in Lebanon. Their first game will be Tuesday evening at 645 and the rest of the week will be determined uh, by, by that game. We do know they'll be playing on Friday as well, but the time of that is not set yet. And then Friday and Saturday is the girls' tournament. That's going to be hosted by uh, Temple Christian in Dayton. And the girls' first game is Friday night at 6 p.m. So it ended up being that both, tournament week, both tournaments are in the same week this year. Uh, guys' tournament got moved up uh, from what it was originally scheduled. But nonetheless, uh, grateful for our kids. They've, they're uh, working hard and have had some uh, good, uh, good ball games this year. Grateful for their, their effort. Then, as you look over on the other side of your bulletin there, the upcoming events, we're at that time of this month where the early part of next month is kind of out of sight, out of mind, because it's not on the front of our calendar. Let me note several things there. That first weekend of the month is going to be a busy one. March the 4th is a Saturday. That's the men's prayer breakfast. That'll be at 9 a.m. And then on Monday the 6th is the Women of Wisdom meeting. That's at 1 p.m. at the Roaches home. And then our couples night out, we're scheduled for Tuesday night. We cannot get the banquet room on Tuesday night, so we move that to Monday night. All right, so it'll be Monday night, March the 6th. It's at the Chop House again. We'll have a sign-up sheet up next Sunday for that, uh, but we'll be meeting there at 5.30 p.m. We've got that fireside room uh, reserved, and so uh, grateful for that. And so I hope we'll have a good group out for that event. It was a special event last year. I hope it will be, and I hope everyone's steak is done to their liking this year. I hope that happens. All right, so someone at my table had some issues. <laughs> They do a great job there. Good, good food. If you've not been in the chop house, you'll you'll enjoy it. I hope you'll hope you'll go with us. All right, my dad, my pastor Meredith will come receive our offering this morning. And the salmon is good there as well. <laughs> Let's have our ushers come. Good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Yeah. Don't you love this time of year when the, the days are getting a little longer and the sun's a little warmer and uh, and especially yeah. young people and they have Monday off. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. uh, and, of course, the teachers have Monday off also. We don't want to forget that. Pastor Brent, you thank the Lord for your offering. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be here in church today and to worship you. We pray that you bless the giver today as they give. We pray you bless the offering as well. Help us use it according to your will. We just pray that you bless the, the message today as it's preached. Help us to apply the truth that we hear, Lord. We just ask that you give the right words to say that we need to hear. And thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Yeah. Freedom's calling, chains are 
unfolding, hope is dawning, bright and true. Day is breaking, night is breaking, God is making all things new. Jesus saves. Hear the hearts of heaven beating. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. And the hush of mercy breathing. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. chapter 9, beginning with verse 10. The title of today's message is Brother Saul. Brother Saul. Boy, up to this point, if you missed last week, you wouldn't be thinking we hear that address to Saul thus far in the book of Acts. But boy, chapter 9 certainly changes everything. 
not only in his life, but obviously his impact that we enjoy to this day. Acts 9, verse 10. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. A lot like what Paul said, or Saul said earlier, right? Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Verse 11. The Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight, be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes, as it had been, scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege we have to gather as your people, as your church in this place today. Lord, I pray that you would continue meeting with us this morning. Lord, I'm grateful to sense your presence in this place, and I pray, Lord, you you do your work and that we would allow your work to continue in each of our hearts and then, Lord, collectively as a congregation this morning. Minister to needs. Lord, give us the faith to respond in obedient faith to thee. We pray your work would continue. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his worthy sake. Amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. So we left off last week with Saul being converted to faith in Christ in a, an unusual conversion event on the road to Damascus. Uh, from that place, he was led to a lodging place that we learned from today's text is in the house of a man named Judas, obviously not Judas Iscariot. And in that house, Paul was, or Saul was there. He spent three days fasting and praying, and the Lord continued to show him some things. In today's text, we see him addressed with that unusual title for this man who's been a great persecutor of the church, Brother Saul. The question I want to ask you today is, first and foremost, are you a brother or sister in Christ? Could someone honestly address you as such? You know, we as believers sometimes around church, and we have people that are here, and, and uh, if we're not careful, I, I've done this, I've caught myself saying this, I, if someone, you know, brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, and I don't know if they're saved or lost. We've got to be careful about that. We're talking, we're talking about being a member of the family of God. It's a wonderful thing to be called a brother or sister in Christ. I've got some preacher friends who are well-educated, uh, highly renowned for their leadership in, in, uh, in, in the church and well-revered nationally or internationally. They just assume to be called brother and whatever their first name is, is to be called by any doctor so-and-so or chancellor or pastor, even any of those things. They're grateful to be a a member of the family of God. That is a wonderful Amen. thing to be called, honestly called, referred to as a brother or sister in Christ. These words must have been very strange for Ananias to utter. They also must have been unusually comforting for Saul in these moments. You think about who he was and what he had done. He was a great persecutor of the church to this point. The Bible uses terms and phrases to describe what he, his vendetta against the church is great persecution, havoc, that would be like a wild beast or wild animal uh, uh, devouring its prey, 
uh, breathing out threatenings, slaughter. He was imprisoning believers. He had been sent to Damascus with letters for the high priest so that he could extradite, imprison and extradite uh, believers from Damascus, uh, from the, the Syria area, back to Jerusalem where they could stand trial. But on that Damascus road, Saul was confronted. He was confronted by the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that episode, in those moments, Paul was faced with the absolute, complete, pure holiness of God. A great light shone down such that it blinded him. He was also completely aware, Saul was completely aware of his unholiness and his total depravity before God. You see, to this point, Saul was trusting what he had learned in education. He had been trained by the greatest educators of his day in Judaism. He was a great philosopher, and he was a, a, a tremendous Jew. Later in the epistles, he'll describe some of his heritage and his credentials in Judaism, but he'll say, I, I do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ. He found on the Damascus Road that all, that all of those things would be set aside, religion, works, a vain repetition, all be set aside that I might win Christ, that I might apprehend that for whom I am, of whom I am apprehended. He wanted to win Christ. He wanted the Lord Jesus Christ. As he was led from that Damascus Road into the house of, of Judas, he was there three days of fasting and praying, and we read from our text that the Lord was continuing to to uh, show Saul some things by, by visions. And we know that, again, bears being said, lest there be any confusion, the, the book of Acts is a transitional period in God's dealing with people on planet Earth, when God's dealing with the souls of men. It's a transition from the Old Testament way into the, to the church age. And early in the book of Acts, we see assigned gifts and other uh, visions and so on and so forth that that they, they kind of fade as we get later in the book of Acts and in the, in the epistles, right? Because God was authenticating the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God was working in Saul's heart and life. Saul had said there on the Damascus Road after his conversion, his understanding of the holiness of God and his unholiness, where Jesus said, it is hard for thee to kick against the bricks. And Saul said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And that really was the question we asked last week. What do we do what the Lord would have us to do? That is a question each of us should really seek to ask and live out each day. Whether you utter those words in prayer to the Lord or not, the heart, the attitude of every child of God should be, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Right. What wilt thou have me to do? And he did what the Lord had told him to do. Today we're going to see the faithfulness of a seasoned believer as well as the faithfulness of a new believer. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. This seasoned saint, seasoned disciple, Ananias, is going to prove his faithfulness to the Lord, as well as this new convert, Saul, is going to prove his faithfulness to to the Lord. My question for you today is are you proving your faithfulness to the Lord? Faithful is our church theme for this year. Faithful to the Lord. We need to be faithful to him. Let's note first of all a faithful Christian. Ananias of Damascus. He was, we see here in our text, first first of all he was a disciple of the Lord. There were certain disciples verse 10 at Damascus. There was a certain disciple at at Damascus named Ananias, a certain disciple. That word disciple means a learner or a follower. And he was a, <clears throat> I love this, but every word in the Bible matters. Right. He was a certain disciple. You know, God has a purpose. God has a plan for your life. Amen. Now, we know what Ananias of Damascus, what God's purpose for his life was on this day, don't we? I mean, it's recorded in the eternal word of God. We know what God's purpose was for his life. God has a purpose for your life. Right. You say, well, if God would record my purpose in, his, in the Bible, then, I, then I, maybe I would do it. Well, I doubt it. If you're going you're gonna to qualify things by, by getting your name named in the word of God, I doubt that you would 
fulfill God's purpose for your life because you're full of pride. Ananias sought the Lord. He was a certain disciple, a follower of the Lord, and it was it, God had a purpose and a plan for his life. Let me get, get a little more specific. God has a purpose and a plan for your day. That's right. A purpose and a plan for your day. Today and every day. There's an obvious reason. And we wouldn't need to argue this at all. It's not, it's inarguable, right? It's an obvious reason why God chose the Ananias of Damascus to fulfill this task and not the Ananias we read about back in chapter 5. One was in it for self-glory. The other was in it for the Savior's glory. Yeah. Listen, this matters. There's a lot of well-meaning, <clears throat> well-meaning believers who think they're serving the Lord when, in fact, they're serving themselves. You say, how do you know that? When you're asked to do something that you think is below you, you refuse. Who are we serving? Let's not be self-servers. Let's serve the Lord. Serve yeah. the Lord. God has a, a purpose and a plan for you today. And fulfill, fulfill that plan. He was a disciple, this Ananias of Damascus, a faithful Christian. He was also dedicated. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Now, you say, Pastor, didn't he, didn't he ask the Lord a question here? You know, I, you, you can search your Bible, but there isn't a question mark here in what Ananias said to the Lord. Now, and I preached it this way, and I don't think it's wrong, and I think he was being inquisitive. But he was doing it respectively. Lord, I've heard a lot about this guy. Now, I'm paraphrasing here, right? You, you follow along there in your, in your Bible. I've heard a lot about this guy. And even now, he's here with letters so he can haul people back. The Lord confirmed, the Lord confirmed his command to Ananias after he asked this question. The Lord confirmed his desire to Ananias. Although he desired clarification, he did not hesitate to obey the Lord. Right. Amen. We might have said, summarized it with, Lord, you know who he is. The Lord knew, look, the Lord knew Ananias' heart, even if Ananias was making, Ananias was making some statements. He was just, Lord, I've heard much about this man. Right. The Lord knew his heart, and the Lord confirmed his command to Ananias. Here, here's my point about his dedication. I found this to be true. And I think this is a, 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 an ex, a, a statement of exclamation here. You will never grow past your commitment. I will never grow past my commitment. There are people, well-meaning people, who say, Pastor, give me a position and I'll be faithful. Would you expect the same of your boss? Well, Mr. Boss Man, I know I'm always late for work, but if you give me the promotion, I'll be on time every time. It would be foolish of the boss man or the boss lady to give you the promotion and expect that you're going to change your poor habit. Right? right? It's required in stewards that a man be found faithful, a woman be found faithful, a child be found faithful. You're never going to grow past your commitment to the Lord. Be faithful to him. Ananias was faithful. He was a disciple. He was dedicated. He was also deliberate. In verses 15 to 17, we see the Lord said, rise and go. And I love this. Uh, the Lord had told him to rise and go. But you know, if you go back up there to verse 11, he was, he was to, there was a certain path he was to traverse. A street called straight. You say, well, isn't that just a, a coincidence that he happened to be to be residing in a street that is called straight? I don't think there are any coincidences. Co that's the word. Yeah, you know, like, I don't think there are. This is on purpose. And I, but I love this. Look, there's a straight, narrow path for us to be following. There's look, uh, Ananias, you go to the street that is called straight. You follow that path. We as God's people need to get back to the old paths. Amen. Amen. Wherein is the good way. Seek the Lord and follow him. And not be like Israel that said, nope, we're not going to do it. We're not going to go that way. Well, I know that's what you've commanded. I know you've told us to seek for the old past. 
we're not going to go that way. We're going to try some new way. Some new way. In Jeremiah 6 and verse 16, <clears throat> the Lord, thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. Now, I, I, want, I want to be make sure I'm clear about this. We can't go back and relive old history. The good old days are gone, and if we would be honest, they weren't probably as good as we romanticize them to be. Every generation has their struggles. Are there things that I wish we, we had some innocency among our children today that I enjoyed in my childhood? Absolutely. Amen. Look, it's not going to change. I read a statistic this week about, about uh, young people and devices and some of the horrid things that kids are exposed to today. I think the average teenage, teenage young man is, is uh, hooked on or been exposed to, to more pornography than most adult males 25 years ago or something like that. I mean, this is mind-boggling to just consider. All these kids don't have a chance. Yes, you do have a chance because we have the Word of God. You've got the Spirit of God. and You can live a pure life in this life in your day. Amen. It's no mistake that you are created for this time. Amen. Stand in the ways and see and ask for the old path. Wearing is the good way. We need to stop pouting, stop complaining, and get busy serving God. Ananias was asked to go see the Christian terrorist of his day. Uh, by the way, go call him brother and lay your hands on him because I spoke to him in a vision. But God didn't ask you to go see a terrorist this week, has he? <laughs> Say, Pastor, you don't know some of my family. Oh, no, all right. <laughs> We can serve God in our day. Amen. He was dedicated to the Lord. There, look, there was a certain certain path that he was to traverse. You, you go this way, Ananias. There's a street. I want you to go down that street. God has a path for us to follow. We need to seek those old paths again. You know, there's nothing wrong with good Christian standards. Amen. Let me rephrase. There's a whole lot right with good Christian standards. Right. Amen. We need to get back. We say, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Preacher, you got your way, I got my way. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Amen. Look, if your way is the right way, I'd like to know it. Is the reverse true? Do I need to meddle there a little bit, or is everybody with me? Mm -hmm. I thought so. <laughs> a certain path. There was a certain place. To tend to. Go to the house of Judas. That's where Saul was staying. God had a has a certain path and a certain place for us to stay. Stay on the path and tend to the place of his choosing. God, if God has blessed you with any responsibility, and listen, if you're a child of God, God has blessed you with responsibility. Right. You say, preacher, I'm just a 13-year-old, and I, I'm here in big church. I'd rather be in junior church, but I'm here in big church. I don't have anything to do. Hey, you've got friends and acquaintances at school, don't you? That's your place for this hour. Right. There's something for you to tend to. Hey, adults, God has given us responsibility, whether we think they're large or small in his work. There are responsibilities. There's, there's a place that we need to tend to. And and I ask, go to a, a certain street, a certain, a certain path you need to, need to traverse. And there's a certain place, certain place you need to go to. And you need to stay where God has placed you and serve him faithfully. And I love this as well. And I ask, there's a certain, place, a certain person there you need to teach. Amen. There's a certain person there you need to teach. Saul of Tarshish. Now listen, I know Saul's already saved at this point in the story. Is everybody with me here? Will you give me a, a little bit of preacher latitude here? <laughs> Souls are one, one at a time. Right. Now I would love for, if you're here and lost, whether there's one or 25 in here today that are lost, I would, I would, would that each of you would come and be saved this morning. But listen, 25 don't get saved together. 25 get saved individually. Yeah. Souls are one, one at a time. I got to thinking about this in my personal experience. When I was a young man after I trusted Christ, 
course, some of you know our family story. My, my uh, parents were saved when I was about three years old and uh, went into ministry shortly after that. I got saved when I was nine. And uh, I had a burden for other people, people I cared about. In particular, one was, I had a, a cousin that I had a close relationship with. And I had a lot, several other cousins. But I had a close relationship with this cousin. And there was a particular day and a particular visit at my grandparents' house. And he lived nearby. And we were there together. And I had purpose. I was going to witness to him. And I did. And a, a, a fumbling child, nine, ten years old, I, I led my cousin to Christ. I, for years, had wondered, did it? Was it real? A few years ago, my cousin sent me a text on Memorial Day. Said, "Hey, a preacher today said that we ought to thank the person that led us to Christ, and we've been saved." I mean, you talk about lighting you up. I mean, man, whew, I was happy. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I mean, he did. He got he got saved that day. But listen, here, here's the thought: none of my other cousins got saved that day. I witnessed to one. My wife and I were witnessing to a couple recently, and and I think on the third or fourth uh, visit, uh, uh, we were witnessing. And on this particular day, I could tell that he was he was getting close, and and so I'm witnessing to him and sharing some truth and answering questions. By the way, there's nothing wrong with asking questions. The answer's in the Word of God. I I'm seeking the Lord. How do I answer this question biblically, honestly? One and the same, biblically and honestly, or the same, and uh, sharing, sharing with, with this uh, man the truth of the gospel. He prayed and asked Jesus to save him. On that day, it was his day. It was, it's one at a time. And it's, it's certain people. Right. I'm for, and again, i got to tread lightly. Now i got everybody's attention. I'm for uh, broadcast evangelism. I'm for any kind of evangelism. Any way we get the gospel out, let's do it. We sent 50,000 John Romans to area homes over the last few years in our community. We broadcast the gospel. We saw some results. I'm for door knocking. You're leaving tracks on doors. You're knocking on doors trying to talk to people. I'm for, I'm for uh, uh, broadcast evangelism. But listen, souls are one, one at a time. When, when you do the broadcast and God gives you a, a, a prospect, then God has placed that prospect on your heart. Let's pursue that prospect for Christ. Some of the prospects live in your home. Seek them for Christ. It's one at a time. Ananias was told, hey, there's a certain path for you to follow. There's a certain place for you to go. There's a certain person you need to teach. Effective Soul winners are focused on ones. And then another one. And I have several people I'm praying for that they would be saved or, or restored to right relationship with the Lord. But I, it's one at a time. Don't discount or minimize the effectiveness of your witness. Amen. Ananias of Damascus was a faithful Christian. Points two and three are much shorter than point one. Point two, a filled Christian. Notice verse 17 there where it says, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. End of the verse there. And be filled with the Holy Ghost. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. Ephesians 5, 17 and 18, the Bible says, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5, 17 and 18. Now, I don't need to spend much time on this because it's obvious to any thinking person that alcohol is bad. Amen. I'll be running by one more time. Maybe I need to spend one more time on this. <laughs> alcohol is bad. Amen. Alcohol is sin. Well, um, doesn't, isn't there margin there? You know, everything in moderation. Everything in moderation. Right, well, I think you ought to go back and consider the context of the text, of that verse, because everything in moderation. Would you apply that? Let's see, you're married. Uh, would you approve of a little moderation in the adultery of your spouse? Just everything in moderation? Preacher, you're being ridiculous. About as ridiculous as anybody will partake of a little bit of alcohol and say everything in moderation. That's right. 
How much arsenic do you want in your beverage this afternoon? Yes. Wine is a marker. I'm sure I'm talking to a room that could probably testify either of personal loss or of family loss or friends, acquaintances who have paid dearly because of the bottle. Whether it be liquid form or pill form, don't be controlled by that junk. Right. Amen. Stay away. Young people, no need to ever touch that stuff. Right. Amen. You say, preacher, it's too late. It's not too late to start over. Right. right. And today's the day to start over. Put that stuff behind you. Uh, it used to be in those good old days, uh, the alcohol and tobacco and whatnot would be put on the altar and it was over. I'm leaving that there. I'm giving it to God. I'm going to move on and serve the Lord. Right. And, uh, you don't need to bring your junk in here in order to get the blessing of God. But I understood what the old timers were doing. Yeah. And when you come to this place, it's a matter of the heart. You leave that junk with the Lord. Whether it be those things or any other kind of uh, immorality, those things, get, get them out of your life. Be not drunk with wine. Don't be controlled by these things. But the Bible says, no, be controlled by the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit of God. Allow the Spirit of God to control you. You know, we're all being controlled by something. Most of us are being controlled by our personal selfish pursuits. That's right. We need to be filled with the Spirit. By the way, it just popped in my head. Some of us in the ministry have the same problem. Right. We think we're serving God. We're controlled by our selfish pursuits. Right. Man, serve God where you are! You ever think about this? Ananias of Damascus. We don't read about his missionary journeys. What if Ananias had told the Lord no? Well, the Lord would have raised someone else up, preacher. Well, I'm glad that you're so spiritual that you know that that's what God would have done. God had a purpose for Ananias to fulfill. Right. What about you? God has a purpose for you. God has a purpose for me. Saul became a filled Christian. And then notice thirdly this morning that he was a following Christian. A following Christian. Verse 18. And, and immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales. And he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ. A following Christian. What did the disciples teach him? Well, Brother Saul, let me tell you how I think a Sunday school class should be operated. Let me tell you, Brother Saul, when you get going on and the Lord's going to put you in the ministry, let me, let me tell you how to have an effective bus ministry, Brother Saul. I don't think they were talking about philosophy of ministry at all. He was learning the Word of God. Amen. I think those Old Testament scriptures were coming alive in Paul's mind. We know it was, because later we'll read about the work that God did in Saul's life here. He'll spend some years in the desert of Arabia. God's working in his life. What did he get? He got the Word of God. Amen. That's how someone grows. Preacher, I need another book about this. I am grateful for authors that write good books, but we need this book. That's right. By the way, it's still the old 1611 King James Amen. Bible. The word of God for the English-speaking people. It doesn't need to be improved upon. There's not going to be a better translation for the English-speaking people. Right. We got it. God gave us the 1611 King James Bible. And pardon me, anybody with a brain can figure that out. You have to look past God's gracious history for the English-speaking people to not understand that 1611 is God's word for the English-speaking people. You really do. I'm not being ugly. I'm being honest. Consider the root. Move on. He was a following Christian. Saul obeyed the truth he was given. Would you? Do you? The songwriter, Ira Sankey, who was movie's assistant there in those revival campaigns of yesteryear, penned the words to simply trust him. The first verse says this, simply trusting every day, trusting through a stormy way, even when my faith is small, trusting Jesus, that is all. 
The chorus says, trusting as the moments fly, trusting as the days go by, trusting him whatever befall, trusting Jesus, that is all. What was Saul doing? On that Damascus road, he was down on his face. He trusted Jesus as his Savior. Amen. What was Paul doing in Damascus in the house of Judas? When Ananias came, he'd been seeing these visions. God was working in his life. He was trusting Jesus. Amen. What was Paul doing when he was shipwrecked? We'll, we'll read about several chapters down the road here in the book of Acts. Trusting Jesus. Amen. Why was Paul a ministry success? Trusting Jesus. Why was Ananias a ministry success? Trusting Jesus. A faithful believer. A faithful new convert, we would say. A faithful new disciple. He was a following Christian. What did he do? How did he demonstrate? How do we know he followed? Well, he was baptized. Acts 2, 41. That day they gladly received his word, were baptized. And the same day there was that to them, about 3,000 souls. Why, that was a big day at First Baptist Jerusalem. <laughs> Maybe it was Bethel Baptist Jerusalem. No, I <laughs> When they received his word, they identified with Christ. Baptism is not a savior, but it's the first step of obedience. Right. If it was important enough for the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man, to be baptized, I think it's important for those of us today who trust Christ as our savior to be baptized. And by the way, biblical baptism is only by immersion. Right. It means to bury. If you are saved and haven't yet followed the Lord and believers' baptism, you need to become a following Christian. You say, Pastor, you say if I'm not baptized, I'm not following the Lord. I'm saying you're disobeying the Lord in that command. Right. It's the first step of obedience for a child of God. Get baptized. Say, I'm afraid of water. We baptize people before who are afraid of water. And guess what? I've been in church now for a lot of I see I'm 52. My dad got saved when I was three. So 52 carried to something, something, something. I think that works out for what? About 49 years. We've never lost one of that yet. And I promise you this. If we had, I'm not about all independent Baptist churches. If we had, it would be public news. <laughs> I'm afraid of water. We can manage that. We've helped some that have been afraid of water. I remember I baptized one person one time. I went down, and this is this is the side thing up there. Went, all right, it's going to be fine. You can tell it. It's going to be fine. I said, we'll do this quick. All right, no problem, preacher. It'll be quick. I went down like this. Bang! I mean, it was solid. They were not going down. You know, it's one of those deals where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> they got baptized. <laughs> and they were glad they did. The things you don't know that go on sometimes. It's sad. He was strengthened. He got some physical need. But most importantly, he got some spiritual need. Mm -hmm. He continued with them certain days. He was taught. He continued with them certain days. Now again, if you'll allow me a little preacher latitude here. If you're a child of God, you've been saved. You follow the Lord and believers' baptism. You need to be a member of a local church. You need to continue with us. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Continue with the Lord. Be in God's house. Be faithful. Uh, be a faithful part of, member of the local New Testament church. And then he moved right into witnessing. And right away, verse 20, straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. You say, what do you think that method sermon was? I, I mean, that may have been it. He may have gone into the synagogue. This is Saul. Who? Saul of Tarshish. Oh, yeah, he's the guy that's come with the letters to arrest all the Christians. He goes into the synagogue. Hey, Jesus Christ is the Son of God! Wouldn't you love to come into church someday, have me stand up, open up my Bible, say, Hey, Jesus Christ is the Son of God! Let's pray and have an invitation. <laughs> right? I'm going to tell you something. That sentence meant something to everybody that heard it. That's right. It meant a lot to Saul. But to everyone from, from his mouth to come out of his lips to those people in that synagogue, whoa. We sometimes think we need a thesis ability in order to share Christ with others. Just tell them how you got saved. That's right. I was out of conviction in this certain place, and man, the Lord convicted me, and I saw from the word of God that I could trust Christ. Now, tell, tell them how you got saved. Amen. You say, preacher, I, 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 how did I get saved? 
Well, if you don't know how you got saved, maybe you need to get saved. Right. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He preached the gospel. And should you and I. I want to invite you this morning to make a wise choice. We've seen from the word of God the importance of being a part of the family of God. Listen, if you're here today and aren't sure that you're a brother or a sister in Christ, would you make the wise choice this morning and come in our invitation allow us to take God's word and show you how you can know Christ as your Savior? That'd be the wisest decision you'll ever make in this life. Because Christ is your Savior. And to those of us who know the Lord, fellow believers, are you a dedicated and deliberate follower of Christ today? Are you following that certain path that the Lord has chosen, listen, for us as his children to follow? There is a path for God's children to follow. There'll be specific places of ministry. Listen, there's a path God has us to follow. Do you agree with me? Are we on that path that God would have us to follow? Let's be faithful to that path and be faithful to the place God has sent us to work. Let's ask the Lord to give us fruit that remains in our orchard and stop waiting until we get to some other orchard somewhere down the road. God has us in this place to produce fruit today. Right. What's that look like? It looks like, Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul through me. One soul at a time. Let's be busy about the master's business. Now I want to close with this statement. <coughs> kind of backwards for most of my messages. It's going to be a little cutting, so buckle up. I've experienced this in my own life, and I've observed it in others. When I am not actively involved in pursuing others, others with the gospel of Jesus Christ, or other believers aren't actively involved in winning others for Christ, we backslide, we stagnate, and listen, we become excellent criticizers of everybody in the ministry. If you've got a critical spirit, I would ask you to consider, are you pursuing others? with the gospel. Your Christian life is a life of winning people to Christ. Right. And if we aren't busy about our task, we become like the children of Israel following a hero leader through the wilderness, and all we're doing is murmuring and complaining because he's got us out of bondage. Let's be pursuing others with the gospel. A certain path. A certain place. Amen. A certain person. <coughs> Let's have heads bowed and eyes closed this morning. Does God be out in your heart today? Those that candidates for baptism can go ahead and make their way to get ready for that. That'd be fine. Has God spoken to your heart today? Has God at work in your life? Are you here today and you say, Preacher, I'm, I'm not sure I'm a brother or sister in Christ. <clears throat> You may have been in this church for a long time. Being a part of a church doesn't make you a believer. You know that. It's what you've done with the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many of you here today and you say, Preacher, I'm thankful that I'm not, although I'm not all I should be, none of us are. I'm thankful that I am a brother or sister in Christ. I'm a part of the family of God. I know I'm saved. Would you hold your hand up in testimony? Boy, a lot of hands all over the room. Praise the Lord for that. That's the testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. You can take them down. Perhaps you're here today and you say, Preacher, I'm, I'm not sure about that. I'm concerned, and I'd like, to, I'd like to get that addressed. If that's you here today, would you slip your hand up and say, Preacher, I'm not sure that I'm part of the family of God. Would you slip your hand up so I'd be aware of that? Anybody like that at all? Just slip your hand up. Anybody like that at all? All right, brothers and sisters in Christ, are we faithful to the path, the place, and that person? You say, I don't have a person in mind, Preacher. Would you ask the Lord to give you one? By the way, I think if you ask the Lord to give you one, he'd probably give you more than one that you can be pursuing with the gospel. God has a place for us to serve. Listen, the key is faithfulness. Faithfulness. Let's be faithful to his calling. Let's stand together, shall we? Father, we thank you for our time and your word today. Lord, I again want to thank you for your presence I've sensed here in this place. Lord, I pray you continue your work now in our invitation time. 
thank you for these candidates who assume you follow you in believer's baptism. Or perhaps there are more here today that need to be saved or need to present themselves for baptism. Pray they take that step of faith. Others, Lord, who need to join your church. Lord, I pray they'd, they'd come and present themselves for church membership. Lord, may each of us allow you to search our hearts, our lives. Sometimes we get our own agenda ahead of your path. We get our own agenda ahead of the place that you have for us to serve you. Lord, help us to be steadfast, unmovable in this pursuit of souls. There are people, there are persons, a certain person you want us to reach. Help us to be busy about that task today and this week. You've spoken to hearts, Lord, help us to respond and to know the meager for you. Thanking you, Lord, for the work that you're doing and, Lord, praying for your empowerment to accomplish that task. Work in our midst this morning, we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. All right, we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. 496. 496. God's dealing in your heart. Let's do business with the Lord this morning. Come spend some time with him at the altar. If you need to be saved today, you come. We'll have somebody take the word of God and show you how you can know Christ. Some are, have stepped out already. Why not you? You come as we sing. The Let's do it. All to Jesus I surrender. Mornings. We'll let them slip in here. Grateful to have our online crowd still joining us uh, here for a few moments as well as we uh, witness the baptism of Jeanette and Dakota. And so we're thankful for their faith in Christ. And are you ready back there? Yes.
Baptized, you and you say you're saved, not baptized. Come and see one of us about that. We talk to you about that. So praise the Lord for that. Let's have a word of prayer for these. And if you'll give me about a 10 second head start, I'll get to the back before you leave. That that will be just fine. All right, let's pray together. Father, thank you again for what we've witnessed today. Thank you for your work in this place. And Lord, we pray for uh, Dakota and Jeanette that they would continue to grow by your grace. Thank you for their step of faith today in following in you and believers' baptism. Help us to be the church that that uh, they need. Help them to continue to grow uh, by your grace. Thank you, Lord, for this place. We pray that you bring us back tonight, the appointed time. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake.